Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Are we okay? Can I start? Go ahead. Hold yours. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. <clears throat> Hope everyone had a had an awesome week. A few years ago, uh, a young man interviewed a businessman, and a businessman was asked, "Sir, you are obviously a successful businessman. You drive a nice car. Your children go to the best schools." Your wife is beautiful. You have lots of money, lots of investments. Your businesses are thriving. And as the young man continued interviewing him, was about to shower him with more admiration, he was taken aback and calmly and collectively asked, <clears throat> Sir, you have no idea how blessed you really are to have all these things. I personally don't have much, but I know that one day, I want to be just like you," said the young man. "I do believe God's favor is upon you." And nonchalantly, the businessman turned to the young man and said, waving his, waving his hand, putting his hand up, and waving it like this, and he's saying, "This is my money. This is my God." <clears throat> Shabbat shalom, everybody. This week's Parsha is Parsha Ki Tisa. Um, to some, it's going to be kind of hard to swallow, but it is something that um, I don't know. I really want uh, for us to hear, and uh, let's go right into it. This, this week's Parsha, uh, I'm calling it my golden calf, our golden calf. No, it's not a nursery run, nor are we, nor won't we won't be enjoying a cup of listening to this around a campfire. <clears throat> it is what God wants for us to listen, to hear, and of course, make Him number one in all of our ways. Make Him number one in all your ways. <clears throat> so let's get into it. Let's talk about the big elephant in the room, or shall we say? A big golden calf in the room. What a mess! You see, as a in a matter of forty days and forty nights, the children of Israel went from hearing God's voice and trembling to replacing His deity by building a golden calf and worshiping it. Now you know we are people that no matter how hard we try to do good and to be good in this life, we always fall short. We fall short because there's always a sense of our old nature that creeps up, that takes over us, and we end up doing bad things. We end up doing bad deeds. It taints us, and these things, uh, to some extent, we later regret in our life. We read in Parsha Yitro about the Ten Commandments not too long ago, and just to remind you of the first two mitzvot. You shall have no other gods before me, and the second one is you shall make no idols. <clears throat> Now Moses has gone forty days and forty nights. When he comes down from the mountain, when he comes down from the mountain, he sees a party going on, a party where neither him nor God himself are invited, so to speak. See, our human nature. Tends to puff us up, and when we need, and when we need to, when we need to have our ears pulled, so to speak, and to learn our lesson, we rebel in our human nature, and by doing that, we do the complete opposite. I want to share a story of my oldest son. Uh, my oldest son is Ian. When he was a young boy, at the, around the age of three years old. Uh, <laughs> He would take food, just like any small kid, just like any toddler. Take a lot of things, or teething, they start putting a lot of things in their mouth. He would take toys, and occasionally, food would fall on the floor, and he would pick it up and he would eat it. But this particular time, it was a, it was a weekend. I remember, in a weekend afternoon, I was having lunch with him. Um, I was feeding him, and some fruit fell on the floor. I told him to pick it up. I, I told him to pick it up because he had done it so many times. But this time, 
I wanted to teach him a lesson. This time, I didn't tell him to just go on the floor, but I went on the floor with him. And I, we both sat on the floor, and I started to talk with him. And out of the talk, I wanted for him to understand the lesson. So we sat down on the floor, and I went to explain to him, son, when the food is on your table, when the food is on your plate, on the table, you can eat it. So when the food is on your table and it falls, you, and, and, and it doesn't fall, you may eat it. However, if it falls on the floor like it did just now, don't pick it up and eat it, but rather throw it away. So he looked at me with his big brown eyes and he smiled. I'm like, aha. My first lesson finally went through to him. It was a heartwarming moment because there I am teaching my son one of his first lessons. Anyway, he continues to look at me with these big, with the big eyes and a big smile on his face. He looks at me, he looks at the food on the floor, and then he looks at the table. And I said, now remember, it's on the floor, you don't eat it. It's on the table, on your plate, you eat it. He looked, he looked, he looked, he grabbed the fruit, put it in his mouth, and he ate it. I thought I had gotten through to him, but... Uh, I was mistaken. Now, mind you that this was a three-year-old boy. But what about all of us who have heard and read Torah? Who has seen God manifested through miracles? Who experiences love and mercy when we need it the most? You see, when things are good and we're making good money and the blessings just keep flowing in, we tend to push God to a side. We tend to push him back. And we dare say, man, I'm good, without acknowledging God or his blessings or his blessings for our lives. Man, I'm good. And the thing that being good is that it reflects your character. So we tend to judge others for it. Oh, did you see what so-and-so did? If it's good, if it's a good deed, it receives a lot of praise. And it even inspires somebody to do good. But also the opposite is true. If it's bad, if we're doing bad deeds, we're going to be labeled with all kinds of hatred. Just the world that we live in. This ultimately decides our faith with God. We see good judgment when we do good before God, when we do good deeds before God, and we judge wisely. But when bad judgment, when we do bad deeds, deeds it pushes us farther away. Farther away from God, farther away from his blessings, farther away from his, his presence. I went to a concert years ago with my wife and, and my children. Actually, my wife was pregnant with, uh, with Isaac. <clears throat> it, was a, uh, it was like a week-long festival, and it was called Creation Fest. Creation Fest is like a, it's like a 1969 Woodstock festival. Uh, so to speak, like it was an open air concert with many faith based rock bands. There were thousands of people waiting to see the main act that evening. Um, that evening, um, as I'm telling the story, that evening, Chris Tomlin, uh, he's a very, very big musician. Um, he was he was headlining that night, and he was and he played an awesome concert and. It was just an awesome experience. We got to, we turned off, it was dark. It was like in a valley and it was really, really dark. And it was nice how we all, from one light, um, he held a candle um, and all the lights were turned off. And he had a mic and he turned on the light, uh, uh, the, the candle rather, with the light. And then with the candle, he proceeded to light everybody else's candles and everybody else started spreading the, the, the light. Uh, figuratively and literally, so to speak. So it was just an awesome experience. But prior to that concert, uh, we were getting ready to go to the stage. And mind you, there's a lot of people. People are from all walks of life, but um, everybody there has something to do with God. They want to be there, to experience the music, to experience worship, all that, all that great stuff. On our way to the stage, though, uh, there was this guy wearing a T-shirt that read in the front, and it was in uh, it was in quotations, quotation mark that said, uh, "God is dead" by Nietzsche. 
and I was perplexed. You know, I was perplexed when when I saw that. You know, I had to do a double take. I'm like, what was it that I just saw? And I couldn't believe what I just saw. But you know, um, I'm a person where I'll just like call you out. I'll go like, hey man, that's a cool shirt. Uh, where'd you get it? And I'll just start like. I'm, I'm like that. I, I start a conversation pretty quick when I see something interesting and I want to talk to somebody. Um, but right when I went to turn and talk to the person, there was another writing on the back. And the writing on the back, it said, Nietzsche is dead, signed by God. So um, it was... Uh, it was a pretty cool T-shirt. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't mentioning anything at all about God being dead. In fact, our God is not dead. He is surely alive. He is living on the inside, in the inside of our hearts, temple, and He's living, and He's living inside, roaring like a lion. That's how we hear His voice. He roars like a lion. The half Torah. Uh, t- touching base on the half Torah too, uh, we talk, uh, we learn uh, through Ezekiel the prophet. Ezekiel uh, describes just how bad our deeds are before Hashem, before God. Their way before me was like uncleanliness. This is uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 36. Their way before me was like the uncleanliness of a woman in her nida. Uh, their nida, referring to uh, a woman's menstrual cycle. It's a self-explanatory figure of speech. I don't want to get into it. But what he's trying to say is, it's he's calling us out. He's like our cleanliness. He's comparing our deeds as dirty as as as, as like I just mentioned. So how do we get away from that? What? What leads us away from that into, into God? What causes us? So what is the plan of action when we're in that situation and there's nothing else, there's no one else that can save us? We need to turn to God. We need to turn away from the bad. We need to turn away from the uncleanliness, this thing, everything, and turn, fix our, fix our eyes on God. Repentance, repentance, actually teshuva. Teshuva is, is uh, repentance. We use it in Hebrew, but repentance is a cry to God that he may blot out our sins and remember them no more. It is also the prime opportunity to do and to be good and to be holy unto God. Ezekiel 36, 31 says, when you remember your evil ways, your deeds that were not good, you will be disgusted with yourselves because of your iniquities and your abominations. Again, how do we get away from this? How do we we go from this state that we're in to God? And to turn to God is teshuva. Teshuva in Hebrew is widely considered to mean repentance. However, it literally means to return, as if you turned away, or as if you looked away from God. Ezekiel Ezekiel 36 also mentions, and this is God speaking through Ezekiel, Moreover, I will give you a heart. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the stony heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my ruach, my spirit within you. And then I will cause you to walk in my my ways. I will will cause you to walk in my laws and my mitzvot so that you will keep my rulings and do them. Ezekiel 36, 36, 26 and 27. I wanted to share a, a true story. Um, story of two uh, Israeli paratroopers, uh, one by the name of Moshe Amirav, and the other one is Abraham Duvdevani. 
they were the first uh, they were the first men, the first Israeli paratroopers, to find and to capture the Western Wall. Now, prior to being captured in 1967, um, it was uh, uh, the Western Wall, the Kotel, was under, uh, at that time, it wasn't under, uh, it was under uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish hands. Uh, it was actually by um, um, by the uh, by the Jordanians, um, and um, where we see the Western Wall today, um, it's a big open area, and, and people are allowed to go there and to. It's it's a big open space with a big wall, but it wasn't it wasn't like so when it was first discovered in 1967 by these two paratroopers. In fact, they. Uh, uh, Abraham, Avraham Duzdevani, he actually explained as we were running in and um, trying to capture the, uh, the Western Wall, we couldn't find it because there were so many buildings. All we had was the golden dome that we had to, uh, that we had to go by in order to find the Western Wall. And the Western Wall, prior to what it is today, where all... Um, all Jews and all people of all faiths and all backgrounds come and they pray. Um, it was at one point, it was a, it was a garbage dump. It wasn't taken care of. And this is mentioned in their, um, in their eyewitness account. And uh, on top of, uh, on top of having, uh, it was like a, it was like a lot of junk and it was like a lot of garbage. On top of that, they only had about the houses to, to the western walls, only about 30 feet. Um, and, the, uh, and actually, the Jews only had about 15 feet to come in to pray. And uh, that was if they were allowed to pray. This was prior to 1967. But again, let me, sh let me just explain... Uh, Moshe Amirov's uh, eyewitness accounts. We ran there, a group of panting soldiers, lost on the plaza of the Temple Mount, searching for a giant stone wall. We did not stop to look at the Mosque of Omar, even though it was the first time we had seen it up close. Forward, forward, Kahima, Kadima, hurriedly. We pushed our way through the Maghreb gate, and suddenly we stopped. Thunderstruck. There it was before our very eyes. Gray and massive, silent and restrained. The Kotel, the Western Wall. Slowly, slowly I began to approach the wall in fear and trembling like a pious cantor, going to the lectern to lead the prayers. I approached it as a messenger as a messenger of my father and my grandfather, my grandfather and my great-grandfather and all the generations and all the exiles who had never merited seeing it. And so they had sent me to represent it. Somebody recited the Shehekiyanu, the, festival of the Fest of Blessing. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive, maintained us, and brought us to this time. I could not answer amen. I put my hand on the stones and the tears started flowing. But they weren't just my tears. They were the tears of all of Israel, the tears of hope and the tears of prayer, the tears of Hasidic tunes, tears of Jewish dances, tears which scorched and burned the heavy gray stone. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, we are on a mission for God. You see, we each have individual missions for Adonai. Not all of us share the same mission because they all go according to our God-given gifts and talents. Honor God by serving. Now going back to, I just wanted to stop here real quick, honoring God by serving. How can you serve God? Do you serve him with money? Do you serve him with, with uh, your first fruits? Do you serve him with, uh, you know, with your time? Do you serve him with your gifts? There's so many ways to serve. Literally so many ways to serve. And God is asking.
blessing us to serve, and not just in one, but in all the gifts and talents that he has blessed us with. If you speak four languages, praise his name in four languages. If, you, if you're a doctor, praise God, and, and God bless you because he has given you the talent, the gift of preserving life, of taking care of somebody's life. Now, serving God means he is to be first in your life, always. You do not put anything or anyone before God. Just like it is written, you shall have no other gods before me. Because if you do, then it becomes worshiping an idol. Now, on a personal note, you might want to take it from me. Now, we're talking about uh, wealth and we're talking about serving God and serving money. Um, I'll give you a personal example. Take it from me. I had to lose everything two times, twice, for me to understand that everything belongs to God. Everything. Everything belongs to God. All my doings, all my efforts, my good deeds, they will never be enough. See, the bad thing about serving money is when you serve, you're not serving God, you're serving money. Your problems are going to mount up. Oh, believe me, they will. They will mount up. There's a song, just to quote it, I won't go too much into it, but there's a song from the 90s that goes, more money, more problems. More money, more problems. And I used to sing that as a kid, and I had, without any understanding whatsoever, I was like, man, this is a great, great tune, man. Just bump my head, put it up on the car. I was listening to it a long time ago. Put it in the car, put the bass up, boom, 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 boom. And here I am, 20 years later, like, oh, okay. Now I, now I understand. Now that's what, that's what that means. The more money you have, the more money you're searching for, the more money you're chasing after, the more problems that are going to come after you. And on top of that, the restless nights that one has to endure, all for the sake of thinking about money. But think about money. It just isn't worth it. You see, after all, I have come to understand all silver and gold belong to God. All silver and gold belong to Him. Everything belongs to Him. So if all silver and gold belong to him, so then why are we worrying about money? And if we don't worry about money, then the flip side, why are we putting money in first place? Why? Like I mentioned, I, I lost, I had to lose everything two times. I planned everything out perfectly to attain everything. I have, I've made a plan, I took time, it, took, it didn't take a, a few hours or even a few weeks, it took a long time for me to plan everything out. And on top of investing in all that time and searching for money and searching for opportunities and just completely pushing God to the side, I lost everything. And not only once, but twice. And on top of Adding insult to injury, all who were considered my friends, my good friends, they deserted me. The two people who I turned to for advice, for prayer, for guidance, for love, for direction, were now passed. They had passed away, and I was alone once more. No money. My face rocked to the core. No friends, nobody to turn to, and no one to turn to. And if a lot of you feel this way, then hold on tight because there is hope. And the hope comes in the name of Yeshua. You see, Yeshua is the understanding of life because his mission was to teach Torah to our hearts. It wasn't just... He didn't come and just to 
reread everything from the Torah. He explained it in detail. He spoke to us as children in parables, and still we didn't understand it. Some of us still don't understand it to, the, to this day. But his words are there. His words live on forever. His teachings live on forever. He is forever. See, he spoke in parables so we could understand as the children of God that we are. And sometimes he would even flat out call out our hypocrisy out. <laughs> this leads me to the um, to Mark, to the book of Mark. Um, in the book of Mark, uh, the the half Torah, the half Torah, I think, starts from uh, uh, Mark nine, but I read um, from like Mark 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 seven to like Mark Mark ten. It was just uh, it was just a lot of great stuff, really. But um, in Mark, Yeshua enters the temple and flips out. His anger leads him to flip tables that weighed as much as a heavy vehicle and seats of the money changers. These tables were thick. I mean, they weren't your top-of-the-line IKEA items. I mean, these were like free trunks. Like, you couldn't push it to move it over. That's how thick and how, uh, how dense and how heavy it was. And Yeshua just threw it up in the air. Like he just don't care. He threw it up and he just lost it. He lost it. It was righteous. It, it, it was righteous anger. It was, it was so that he didn't let anyone bring the money and the doves to sell in the temple. He, he, Yeshua blocked off the entrance so that no button, no, uh, no doves or any other stuff that they were selling inside the temple would go in. Like that's how that's how how zealous he was for for God and for the temple. And look, I don't, do not. You, this is a, a house of prayer. This is a house of prayer of Adonai, and you guys have turned it into a den of thieves. He blocked off the entrance. He couldn't believe the hypocrisy that was going on. But further on, he gives us the Daenerys, the Daenerys example, the, the coin. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now, mind you, after everything he had just said and the, the scene that he had caused in, in the temple, the Parashim, the Pharisees, the Parashim had the goal to ask another hypocritical question. He calls out the hypocrisy twice. The first for conducting business in the temple, malicious business dealings, and the Daenerys with Caesar's face on. You see, you shall have no gods before him, and their concern for paying taxes, money. That's what their concern was, money. <clears throat> and no less, talking about it in the temple. Um, there's no absolutely no idol worshiping ever, and these guys are these guys had these guys were doing it inside the temple. They were doing business dealings. They were who who know, it's not recorded, but who else knows what else was going on? It, but it was very very fishy. It was so fishy, in fact, that Yeshua lost his cool and he flipped out. But it was a righteous way of flipping out because he is. Him and the Father are one. Him and God are echad. So if he was mad, just like you, just like God was mad with B'nai Israel in, uh, in the desert in Mount Sinai, when Moses came down and like, what are, what are they doing? And you see this big golden calf and like, I don't know where this came from. You know, God flipped out, and just the same way he flipped out when he saw that, Yeshua flipped out and when he saw the people doing the same thing, but with money. See, the parallel of Moses, Moshe, dealing with Ben Israel, and Yeshua dealing with the Perushim, the Pharisees, and the way they're equally rebuked are uncanny. If you miss this connection, 
then you're not alone. But are we alone? We are not alone. And in fact, we are never alone. We are not alone because the plans of the heart belong to man. But the tongue's answer is from God himself. See, all of our ways are pure, but in our own eyes, not in God's eyes, in our own eyes. We are not righteous. God is righteous. We have to strive to be righteous. We have to live righteously. We aren't born righteous. We have to live righteously. And how do we live righteously? Living, living and, and, and experiencing, but living through the Torah. Being the Torah for other people. There's a lot of people in all walks in life and haven't heard of Yeshua, haven't heard of God, don't know anything about this stuff that we, that we know. And it is up to you guys. It is up to you guys with your gifts and your talents to spread the word, to spread the, the, the Hava, spread the light, the light that Yeshua kindled in your hearts. The plans of the heart belong to man. The tongue's answer is from God himself. See, friends, Avarim, see, whatever you commit to, <coughs> commit it to God, and your plans will succeed. You see, God works out everything out for his own purpose. Do not let pride smudge your good deeds from you from living and reaching Torah and living an awesome, awesome life that God wants us to, to live. For when your ways are pleasing to God, he will even make your enemies be at peace with you. You will live in peace. You will live and you will be in peace. Now that's something that many of us take for granted. We take peace for granted and peace is not it's 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 not like the harmonious thing that we see around in movies or books well it's peaceful you see somebody just sitting down with a smile peace is when you are echad with god when everything not echad like yeshua is where like you know we are god and he is us or, he is me and i am you not that kind of uh echad but echad where there's a connection. There's dialogue. We're doing the things that God had, has wanted us to do for, um, um, has want us to do that will uplift us in what we do according to our gifts and our talents. We have to use them for God. We have to use them for, for a holy purpose. Again, we have a mission. We have a mission to spread that light. So for when your ways are pleasing to God, he will make even your enemies be at peace with you. You will experience peace. There is nothing more beautiful than to be at peace with God. You see, because better is a little with righteousness than a lot without justice and without peace. So I say to you, Haverim, on this awesome Shabbat, may your hearts lead you to do great things. And may God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your paths. May God bless you and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.